ladies, you are listening to Women Emerging Fearlessly. Did you know that four out of five women struggle with confidence and knowing who they are? This show is dedicated to helping women lead their lives with fearless confidence and to know how amazing they truly are. In this show, you will hear from women who are emerging fearlessly, who have overcome many obstacles to pursue their dreams and passions, and they will inspire you and encourage you to stand up, step out, and speak up. Be your authentic self and bring your true gifts to the world. My name is Janelle Anderson, and I am your host. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a great review and subscribe and share it with your friends. Enjoy the show. Well, welcome everybody to Women Emerging Fearlessly. Welcome to this episode. Today, I will be having a great conversation with my guest, Nancy Murphy, and I'm really excited to be introducing her today. It's going to be an interesting conversation. She spent her career saying what others are afraid to say and learning to say it in ways that people will listen. And I love that because I'm always working with women to you know, really empower their voice to be heard. And how do you do that? How do you get people to listen? Nancy has worked in government, philanthropy, national nonprofits, and global consulting companies. As founder and president of CSR Communications, she teaches leaders how to influence and persuade others so they can realize their vision for change faster with less frustration and resistance. And her clients include Sodexo, Annie E. Casey Foundation, City of Baltimore, and Temple University. So welcome, Nancy, to the call. Great. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I'm excited to have this conversation. I love to just talk to women about what they're doing in the world and how they have emerged fearlessly and pursued their dream. So I'm excited to hear more of your story. And I know in your paperwork that you sent me ahead of time, it says that you're You've experienced the challenges of leading big change within established organization. That's got to be challenging because people don't like change very much. Right. (laughs) Especially in big organizations. Um, And I'm really curious about your story, too, because you talked about, you know, challenging the stereotypes of girls in Catholic school. I was raised a Catholic Mm. and was in Catholic school all the way up until eighth grade. And of course, you know, we had to wear our uniforms and our saddle Oxfords and pleated skirts. And we yeah. had <laughs> nuns or our teachers in those scary habits. And I remember them lining us up in the hallways to go to the bathroom or anywhere. And we had to be in a perfectly straight line. In fact, they would stop us and look down the line. And if anybody's head or shoulders were out of place, man, you'd get in so much trouble it was a scary place to be as a kid. It really was. And especially as a girl, we didn't, I remember being really quiet and not wanting to speak up and just sitting in the back of the room. The girls would be in the back, the boys in the front. And I was so afraid to just say anything. And that really became a part of my, you know, struggle with being heard and with speaking up and with being confident. So that is fascinating to me that you did that work um, with those girls. So I'm excited to have this conversation. So tell us a little bit kind of about that. If you could talk about that work that you did with those stereotypes of girls and just go from there. Yeah, well, I mean, that was when I was a student is this wasn't, you know, necessarily work that I did. It was um, I spent 16 years in Catholic school. So I went all the way through college. So real glutton for punishment, I guess. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) But I guess early on for me, And this was a theme that's just carried throughout my life. You know, I would I would see things that I perceived as injustices or unfairness or things that could even if they were great, could be even better. And for me, one of those things was um, these subtle and not so subtle messages we got all the time as girls in Catholic school about our value, about our potential and about um, our role in the classroom, which was oftentimes not just sit in the back and be quiet, but don't distract the boys. 
Yes. So it was really about the boys as the center of the universe and their future and their education. And we were just not supposed to get in the way not, you know, heaven forbid we could contribute anything to the conversation or yeah. actually enhance the classroom experience, right? Right. So um, one of the things I learned in that experience was how to find allies for the advocacy that I was championing in that moment. And one of those allies for me in about seventh grade was um, a Salesian brother who was assigned to our school from the Salesian Boys Club downtown. And he was younger and I think a little more, you know, forward thinking. And how could I and a few of the other girls enroll him as an ally in talking to the teachers and the principals about principal about some of the things that we just thought were ridiculous, but maybe they wouldn't listen to us alone. But if we had another adult who could be that bridge and that champion for us, how could we? make that a little more effective. Wow. That's fantastic. You were doing that even as a student. Yeah. 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 You must be, have you ever taken the Enneagram? Yes. Okay. What, what number are you? I'm a one. I knew it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to say you've got to be a one with the advocacy and championing. Oh my gosh. My daughter's a one. So she'll be editing this, this podcast. She'll be like, Oh yeah, that's me. Uh, yeah, totally, totally. Uh, standing up for the the people at risk, the people that are, you know, yeah, those causes like, you know, making things right, making things better. That was one clue that you said, like, it could be better. I'm like, oh, my gosh, she's got to be a one. Yeah. So- <laughs> awesome. Well, tell us about your work um, as this this whole idea of intrapreneurship and how that's different from, well, explain what it is, first of all. And then- yeah. So, I mean, I think the other part of my story is that I spent my whole career feeling like I didn't quite fit in to the organizations where I was working. So, even though I was very successful and, you know, got promoted and it wasn't that, um, I was always struggling to do my job. It was more that I had this entrepreneurial mindset that I think was ingrained in me from my grandfather and great grandfather who were entrepreneurs. And so I had this mindset of innovation, of improvement, of seeing opportunities where other people saw problems, but I was in these status quo preserving organizations and systems. And so I was kind of always that one that was bucking the status quo or, you know, having my colleagues hide from me in the hallway because I was that broken record about why can't we do things differently? Why can't we do things better? And I was, you know, kind of beating my head against the wall and, and changing jobs every few years because I would get so frustrated. And it wasn't, you know, really until... I was probably in my 40s that I had this aha about, you know, I learned of this concept of the intrapreneur, the person who is bringing that innovative mindset, that entrepreneurial mindset to established organizations and really serving as that internal change agent. So entrepreneurs want to make the world better by striking out on their own and disrupting systems and industries from the outside. And that's important and valuable, and we need those people. But their solutions are, you know, their impact at first is this big, right? It's tiny because they're just getting started. And sometimes it never grows. That's true. Yep. But we've got these people who are have that same mindset but they're inside organizations that are already at scale. So how can we take all of the support and celebration and kind of, you know, um, the way we honor entrepreneurship in our uh, society and how can we do that same thing for those internal change agents so that they can leverage the scale, the resources, the reach, the expertise, the financial stability to accelerate the change that we're trying to see in the world. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And I I can see where that would really have a great impact um, in a great way, because like we said earlier, you know, change is hard 
and especially yes. in big organizations. Um, and I've heard a lot about change management in recent years and things like that to, um, and even like I have clients that are in organizations in leadership. And that's one of the big struggles is, you know, the, they want to see change and they want to bring innovation, but there's sometimes resistance to that. Yeah. And that's, you know, you mentioned change management and I will just say that one of my <laughs> sort of pet peeves is, is we use like the, the prevalence of the term change management because it kind of implies that change is something linear and logical and controllable. And if we just follow these steps and we know the six stages and we know, and that's not really the way change happens. So I prefer the term change leadership because I think most of change is really about how we lead people to listen to things they don't want to hear or how we lead people to be open and embrace change. And then there's the implementation pieces that can come after with the stages and steps, but we really need the leadership. And let's not pretend that it's something that's so predictable and controllable and, you know, kind of from a management perspective. So that's just my two cents on that one. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense. And I really like that because I've wondered what does that mean? Change management? How do you manage change? <laughs> so leadership, that, that's really powerful, very powerful. Let's talk a little bit about the types of resistance that people have, because I feel like a lot of a lot of my audience listening to this could probably relate to that. I think we all have this tendency to resist change. So talk a little bit about types of resistance to change and how you can overcome them and how do you work with people to overcome that? Yeah. So one of my favorite cartoons that I use a lot in, um, in my presentations is uh, someone standing behind a podium speaking to a room full of people. And he says, who wants change? And everybody raises their hand. And then in the next panel, he says, who wants to change? Nobody raises their hand. Cricket, you know, <laughs> right? Because right. a lot of us want the world to be different. We want our organizations to be different. We want our families to be different, our relationships to be different. But we think that means everybody else changing, not us, right? Oh, yes. And so, so resistance to change is very common. And what I teach the leaders I work with is that resistance isn't all bad. Think about resistance like strength training, right? In or those football players who run with the giant, you know, weights uh, banded around them to it makes us stronger. So if we can be open to resistance and understand what lies beneath resistance, then we can use it to our advantage. We can use it to make our ideas better and stronger, to illuminate our blind spots. The three most common types of resistance that I've identified are the what ifers, the status quo defenders, and the yes knowers. And I'll tell you a little bit about what each of those means. And what, what at least one thing you can do to overcome that particular type. So the what ifers are kind of those yours in our lives. <laughs> um, in my experience, a lot of the what ifers happen to be lawyers, right? These are the people who are trained to think of the worst case scenario. Right. <laughs> like, well, what if we make the change and you know we lose all of our clients? Or what if we make this change and half the staff leaves? Or what, you know, they're the doomsday scenario folks. So these folks can be great. A lot of us who are entrepreneurs at heart, even if we're working within organizations, we tend to be overly optimistic. That's great. We need to be to, you know, pursue all these crazy ideas. So we need these what ifers to illuminate our blind spots and maybe get us to slow down a little bit if we're moving too fast. So one of the ways that we can overcome this type of resistance is to invite these folks to be our scenario planners, give them a role that plays to their strength. So have them go as deep and dark as they possibly can about all the things that can go wrong and then have them, you know, think through, OK, what's the worst thing that could happen? How likely is that to happen? It's probably not very likely, but even say it's 50 percent likely. OK, great. What would we do if it did happen? So you give them the opportunity to, to help you plan. 
The second type, the status quo defenders. I mean, all of us have probably encountered these folks in, in any organization, no matter how small. There's always someone whose identity is kind of tied into the status quo. And so one of the things we have to be careful with in this type of resistance is when we criticize the way things are, people can perceive that as criticizing them. True. Right. And they're going to get very defensive. So we want to be careful of that. This is where the language of, yes, things are pretty good, but they could be even better. Like, don't we want to continue? You know, it's sort of not dismissing what currently is, but dreaming for something that could be even better. And one of the ways we can get these folks involved and overcome their resistance is invite them to do some assessments, some scans of the current ways of doing things, for example, and identify against a set of criteria that you provide um, what things are worth preserving as we move forward. So we might not want to throw out everything about a particular process or practice or way of working or way of thinking, but let's be clear on what we want to preserve, and it may not be everything. So those are the status quo defenders. The last type are the yes knowers. And there are actually four sub subtypes to this. I won't go through them all, but it has to do with, these are the folks who sit in your office or sit in the meeting and shake their head. Yes, they're on board. Yes, they're ready to do what you're asking them to do. And then they walk out the room and they do the complete opposite <laughs> or they just ignore it, right? <laughs> right. That's super frustrating because we think they're on board but they're not. So their resistance is kind of covert in a way. And so what we want to understand for these folks is, is that resistance because of a lack of will or a lack of way? So if it's a lack of will, like the stallers are the lack of will. So the stallers are the folks who've been in the organization for a long time, they were there before you got there and they're going to be there long after you leave. And they think they're just going to wait you out. So they have no interest in the change. And if they just drag their feet, stall long enough, you're going to get frustrated and give up on the change or you're going to get really frustrated and leave. And so for them, we need to make sure that there are clear consequences for not adopting the change or not engaging in the new behavior and that they understand what those consequences are and they're, they're real. For the folks um, for whom it's a lack of way, those are the strugglers. So that's one of the two subtypes. And for them, they really want to do what it is you're asking them to do. They want to change, but everything in the organization is making it too hard for them to do that. So Sometimes we have what I call artifacts that get left behind in organizations, all those little things that say, no, we really value this, or this is how things really get done around here. And if all those artifacts are reinforcing the old way or the status quo, all the policies and procedures and checklists and promotion criteria, and all those things are sending different signals or creating too much friction for the person to do the thing you want them to do to make the change, then they're going to struggle. And so we want to eliminate those artifacts that we can control so that we minimize the friction and enable them, give them the way to make the change that we want. That is golden. All of that. That's fantastic. I could, I'm sitting here listening to you thinking how this also could apply to entrepreneurs, because I think all of those, um, all those resistance to change show up. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, yep, yep. I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Like even just I'm by myself here, but all of that, like, uh, like, especially, you know, the yes, no, you know, I can jump on board with a new idea and then sure enough, either I don't know the way how to do it, or I struggle with procrastinating and, you know, resisting yeah. doing anything new, but I love how, you know, the, how to overcome them. What I heard in that was just giving them a new, like really validating where they're at, but giving them kind of a new perspective. You know, it's validation, like, yes, this has been great what you've done. And I can, I can definitely relate to that, you know, taking that personally, if somebody wants to come in and change everything and you're like, well, wait a minute, this is how we've always done it. And I was a part of that. And you're attacking me personally. 
So even, you know, if you are a, a business owner, it could be even your own processes that you've instilled as a business owner and you need to make some changes Yeah, because life changes and we need to be able to be open to new things, new ways of doing things and being aware of those things that are hanging us up and causing that resistance. Um, and I love also that, you know, resistance is not necessarily bad. It can cause us to grow stronger and learn and, um, and certainly, you know, when you work out, you're, you're using resistance to, to build your right. muscles and get stronger. And so even in those times where change is hard, um, that's where you get stronger. That's where you learn the most. That's where you grow the most. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what's interesting is I also teach the leaders I work with to, to see this resistance in themselves. So just as you mentioned, right? Right. So sometimes when we're leading change, we fall so in love with our own idea, our own vision for the future, our own plan for getting there, that we don't create the space for people to shape it, to tweak it, to, ad to adapt it. And so where are we exhibiting these types of resistance as well? I mean, this is not unique to, again, this isn't about everyone else. You know, it's about how do we as leaders show up? How open are we to change? How willing are we to change ourselves? So yeah, this is, these are universal. Yes, they are. <laughs> and just being open to other ways of looking at things, like even the what ifers, you know, that what they have to offer is valuable for those that are just looking at, you know, all this wonderful, these wonderful ideas, these big ideas, which you can get caught up in. But if you don't have the what ifers to kind of bring you back down to earth or even to come up with that plan B, what if this happens? Are we ready? Can, how are we going to deal with it? And that can take away a lot of fear and a lot of resistance because you've got a plan for it. That's why, you know, it's good to have. As, as entrepreneurs, it's good to have uh, accountability partners or mastermind groups or, you know, other people to bounce your ideas off of that can come up with the what if scenarios. Uh, yes, definitely. we need them. Yeah. Yeah. And so that make you think like, OK, what will I do if that happens? And then you've got a plan of action. It doesn't stop you. Yes, definitely. So, yeah. So we had what ifers. We had the what was the middle one? The status quo defenders. The status quo defenders. We've always done things this way. Why yes. do you change? <laughs> yes. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? That's yes. one of my yes. favorite phrases. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. That is, I see that everywhere. Um, and so with that too, I love that approach of um, what do we want to keep and what do we want to tweak even, you know, to make it better so we can move forward. That really helps to that language helps, I think, to open people up and, and help them not take it personally that change is a bad thing or that what you've been doing, the status quo has been good up to this point, but you know, yeah, uh, we don't want to get stagnant. I mean, you can look at these big corporations that are always changing, you know, the changing their logos or changing their, their advertising or changing their products because you have to, you know, life is all about flow and movement and change. And if something stays the same too long, it gets stagnant, stale, irrelevant. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good point because I, I, sometimes the other thing you'll hear from the status quo defenders is because they see the value in the way things are, right? They're defending the status quo. They want to preserve and protect that. And so they'll push back a lot around, well, is this just change for change's sake? Like just, you know, we need to reorg every three years or every three weeks just because, you know, and they don't. So one of the things that we need to do as leaders all the time, um, not just with the status quo defenders, but especially with them, is to be clear on the why for the change. And to communicate that, not just once, not just twice, not just 10 times, right? But over and over and over again, the why for the change and the why now for the change. And so we want to be careful that we're not jumping on the change for change sake bandwagon or I'm a new, I'm a new leader in this organization. I want to do things differently just because. Um, and at the same time, realizing that 
just because something isn't broken now doesn't mean if we wait until, you know, we're too far behind or when it is broken, that's probably not the time to start, you know, figuring out the change and leading the change. So it's that delicate balance of not just change for change's sake, but not waiting until we're too far behind or till something really is broken to try to fix it. Yeah, really good point. Both of those are great points to to think about, not to change just for change sake. Uh, it makes me think of shiny new object um, that happens a lot with, I'm sure people in organizations too, but it's like, oh, let me try this new thing because it just appeared and it looks interesting. And then you're following that and you didn't finish the other thing you were already working on. And that can really lead to getting stuck. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, so we need everybody, we need every perspective, which is what I'm hearing, you know, in this, within organizations even. What are some of the common mistakes that most of these entrepreneurs, these people that want to bring change, what, what are some of the common mistakes that they make and how can yeah. they? Them? So some of them we've touched on. Um, a big one is the change is all about everybody else. And how do I get everybody else to do what I want? <laughs> right. <laughs> and so one of the first things that that I teach change leaders is how to look in the mirror, right? So what does it mean to be a credible leader of change? And we start with ourselves. And as we become the credible leader of change in it and sort of model the behavior that we want to see and model the openness to change and to be uh, willing and open to be influenced. That's how we start influencing others. So um, that's one of the mistakes is that thinking it's all about everybody else and not about ourselves. Um, another mistake is the, I think it's the, the failure to embrace the campaigner mindset. Mm. So it's that idea I mentioned a, a minute ago about thinking you communicate something once and, you know, you just send an email to everybody in the organization or everybody on your team and done, check. Yeah, yeah they got it, sure. <laughs> That's how people are. <laughs> right. And yeah. so it's that idea, like I, I liken it to um, somebody running for office on the campaign trail, right? They're giving that same stump speech hour after hour, day yeah. after day, week after week, month after month with the same level of enthusiasm as they did the very first time. So when we're communicating a vision for change, we've got to be that campaigner over and over again. When people raise their objections and their concerns, act like it's the first time you've ever heard that, even though you've heard it all day long or, or you never thought of that. You know, of course you thought of that. You have a plan for how to overcome that, right? Or as if you're hearing the question for the first time. So that's a mistake is not adopting that campaigner mindset, thinking we communicate once and we're done. Um, and another one is thinking we communicate. It, it's how most influence strategies work inside organizations. It's the mass communication. So it's that I'm going to have one town hall or send one meeting, uh, one email to everyone, and it's all going to be the same and then check done. And it's understanding what are the different pockets of resistance and what are the different things underneath them? Um, what are the different, you know, kind of personas of different stakeholder groups within your organization who need to be part of the change? And how can you get really clear on their perspective and what messages they need to hear? What obstacles are in their way of implementing the change or adopting the change? And how can you help them clear those? Um, that the message and the method and the vehicle are not going to be the same. It's not a homogenous mass form of communication. Right. Because we are dealing with people and people are different and everybody brings a different perspective. So it's not a one and done kind of deal and to be able to realize that and to know, Hey, this could take some time. I've got to build some relationships. I've got to, I love the Stephen Covey, you know, let's seek first to understand where's everybody else coming from and being open to hear that and include everybody. Then you've got to 
team working together instead of just one person saying, Hey, this is the way it is. And yeah. And you know, that, that is the other. So when I share those mistakes or talk about these processes, I can kind of like see the like shrinking of the, the leaders I'm talking to like, Oh my God, under the weight of all of that effort. Right. And so that's the other big mistake people make is believing they have to do it alone. Right. Yeah. Mm. And from the very beginning, not finding that that story I told of the Salesian brother in my Catholic school, grade school, you know, advocacy effort. I found that champion, that ally. I found like minded girls who and boys who wanted to advocate with me. And so as change leaders, we don't have to go it alone. You don't have to have the 4,000 conversations with every employee. You know, you don't have to give the stump speech hour after hour, week after week, month after month alone. How can you enroll others early on and create kind of that change circle, that leadership circle, and have those people carry the burden with you, be that ripple effect? In some ways, they're going to be Others might be more influential in certain stakeholder groups, right? They might be the better spokesperson or the better advocate. So don't make the mistake of going alone. Yeah, no, that's that's really perfect. And I was thinking, you know, the analogy with the campaigner, even people campaigning for office have a team with them and other people going out and getting on the stump with them and for them. And you're right, like some people have influence with people that you wouldn't because they've got a relationship or it's their personality or whatever they bring uh, to, to the conversation. They might have a more, uh, more influence with certain people than you. Yes. And then again, you know, relieving that burden of like, you have to carry this thing all by yourself. So, well, how does somebody who's in leadership, how do they know that, Hey, it is time to change. How do they know that it's time to, to lead this effort when, when do they know? Yeah, it's time to do something here. Yeah, well, I think there's a difference between knowing when you're ready as a leader and knowing when the time is right. And so let me talk about each of those just real briefly. Um, I think knowing when the time is right is probably a little trickier. I think there are I mean, if someone really is that entrepreneurial mindset, they're probably seeing opportunity all the time. Probably. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think, again, it's don't wait until something feels broken or literally is broken. Looking for opportunities to start with the small change. You know, it's kind of that idea of micro micro commitments or progressive agreement. How do you enroll people in small things first and then let it snowball to maybe a whole organization wide transformation? But looking at, you know, COVID this year and the the pandemic um, uh, fallout, I think so many things in our organizations are the status quo is in total upheaval. So that's a perfect time. For leading, right? Because everybody's sort of like everything's up in the air anyway. So we were all now working from home. Maybe now is the time to, you know, try something else out. Or with the the racial reckoning and racial equity conversations that have been happening in many workplaces that were not happening before. Um, you know, there there is a moment in time the universe has presented us with an opportunity that you know, how can you step up and accelerate something that maybe you've been thinking about? And now, you know, there's a, there's an opening, the door is there. In terms of how you know, whether you're ready to lead the change, I see sort of two types of leaders, and these will probably sound familiar to you. You know, there's that, that overconfident leader, Um, sometimes this can be younger people who like, we don't know what we don't know, (laughs) Um, (laughs) tends to be uh, more male leaders, I think, than women leaders, um, where we see all the problems and we've got the answer and we have this great idea. And how do I just get people to listen to me? How do I get, you know, so it's like, we're, we're really eager. And so 
to know whether you're ready to lead if you're that overconfident person and you think you see all the mistakes and why don't other people see it? And um, I would say, you know, you're ready to lead when you're ready to be humble and open and curious and really, really ramp up your listening skills. Yeah. You know, I know you did a, an episode on that of the Stephen Covey and I just, I love that. And so if we see all the mistakes and we think we've got the right answer and we're not ready to be that great listener, that open, curious, humble leader, then it's probably not ready for change. The other type of leader is um, again, more women, I find, uh, exhibit this where we're underconfident. So we see the opportunity. We think that we can, you know, that there's change that we can lead, but we're waiting. We're waiting maybe until we get the promotion. So we feel like we've got the formal authority or we're waiting until we have more time or there's more resources or you've got a partner, you know, who can go with you on the journey. And I think for those folks, it's I, I've got a tool that um, that I use with a lot of my leaders called the confidence cultivator, and it helps people remember a time in the past when they took that leap and they weren't confident and how they gained confidence by making that commitment and taking action and what they learned along the way and the skills they gained so that they you know have confidence in that area now. And so it's reminding them that they'll get the confidence by acting by making that commitment and that decision, and then giving them some little places to start on the journey so that they can, again, start to build that momentum and get some early wins. So I think depending on which type of, of leader you are, there are different signals to know when you're ready. Um, and so it's just kind of being self-aware enough to ask the right questions and then find a place to start. Well, that's really, really helpful. I love what you said about the confidence cultivator. I know that taking action builds confidence. Women do struggle so much with not feeling confident and are waiting or just being held back by those thoughts of, I'm not ready. Uh, who am I to do this? Um, I need somebody to help me, you know, all of those thoughts. And uh, I know from my work with women, it's creating those wins and, you know, looking at what you've achieved in the past, what in you helped you to get there and to do that. And then what can you do? What's a small action you can take? So I really, really uh, agree with that as um, a tactic or a strategy um, about for that type of person. So yeah, that really resonates with me. You know, one of the things that you probably recall from your Catholic schoolgirl days too, is this idea of waiting to be invited. Oh, yes. You know, invited to the table, invited to lead, invited to, and, uh, you know, that's something I struggled with a lot earlier in my my professional life is just um, waiting my turn, waiting right. for the invitation. And, you know, I just, I encourage all the women out there listening to this to, you know, if we wait for the invitation to get the seat at the table, we're never going to get there. So true. so true. <laughs> waiting for permission, waiting for the invitation, because we were taught, especially our, you know, generation, I think younger women maybe are not, they're, they're being um, released more into yeah. places, but we were taught to wait. That was what a a lady did, right? You, you weren't, mm -hmm. uh, aggressive or assertive or, you know, you had to wait and be asked and, and wait for that opportunity or wait for that permission, wait for somebody to notice that what you have. And I, I have done that my whole life really until recently. Um, but just to own your own value and worth and know that what you bring to the table is already needed and it's already valuable and don't wait for somebody to invite you, people are not usually looking. They're take, they're thinking about themselves usually. Right. <laughs> they're right. not thinking about you like you think they are. And just step in there and do it and try it. I mean, I think also in this conversation comes like, how do you look, how do you view so-called failure? What if I step in there and try it and I didn't get invited, but I just started and did something. And then what if I fail or what if somebody criticizes me? Well, being able to have that sense of confidence about yourself that that's okay, because somebody may disagree with you. Somebody may not like what you say or do, but if you trust yourself and believe in yourself, 
it's okay if other people disagree with you, number one. And number two, if you do make a mistake, you can learn from it. But if you never step out and do something in the first place, there's no chance that you're going to learn how to improve. Yeah. I mean, that's why the the program that I run for entrepreneurs, my influence lab is called the lab for a reason, because I want to get leaders in that mindset of testing, experimenting, trying things out, learning, like nothing is a real failure. Your hypothesis might not have proved out, right? But what did you learn from it? What are we going to, how are we going to adapt? What are we going to try differently the next time? So I sort of over embrace that lab (laughs) metaphor, (laughs) that lab analogy, because um, I really want people to see everything as a testing, a learning and experimenting, um, sharing lessons with each other. It really is all about um, growth and and learning and not doing something once. And if it doesn't work out, sort of writing off the entire effort. Exactly. That's innovation. You know, people are always, innovators do that. They try different things, experiment differently. I mean, I always think about Thomas Edison, you know, who tried what 10,000 ways that failed supposedly with the light bulb, but he was like, no, I didn't fail. Those were successes because I learned what didn't work. (laughs) And just having that kind of mindset that, Hey, let's play, let's try different things. Let's see what works and what doesn't life is kind of that way, you know, instead of being stuck in this perfectionistic mindset, which women often get caught up in that it has to be perfect before I can even put it out there. Because what if well perfect as the one on the Enneagram, yes, this is something I have struggled with for I know. <laughs> a long, long time. It was such a gift to understand my one, yes, my oneness on the Enneagram and yeah. what I, you know, what I could do about it. But um, exactly. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's really helpful for people to understand their personality, their strengths, who they are, and how they typically show up, because then it's easier to move around those things that before, you know, maybe stopped you or blocked you or kept you uh, quiet. I know that's helped me a whole lot to see mine. And that's, I do that with my clients. Enneagram, Strengths Finder, just understanding who you are, especially as a woman leader or a woman business owner is huge in building that confidence that who you are is absolutely amazing. And you don't need to change who you are. You just want to grow who you are, you know? So having that mindset, And I love the idea of the lab. You know, I do a lot of that kind of work too, like practice things and try them out and see what happens and learn from them and keep growing. You know, it's all about continuing to grow and become more of who we are really. So, well, the work that you're doing is fabulous and so powerful. I'm so glad that you're doing it. Are you like a consultant with companies around change? Yeah, so um, we have uh, a few different ways we work with organizations, and it's really any team or organization that has a social purpose. So it can be the sustainability team inside a Fortune 100 company, city governments, philanthropy, nonprofits, Um, doesn't matter what your tax status is, it's sort of are you trying to advance some sort of social good in the world. Of course, because you're yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, and we do that through um, strategy, support and strategy development, um, a program we call Mind the Essence, which is about getting to the core of that message and how to ca- communicate effectively. And we have some board development programs as well, particularly for nonprofits and foundations for philanthropy. Um, and then Our keystone program is the Entrepreneur's Influence Lab, and that is for um, individual leaders, for cohorts of leaders within organizations who are leading change together. Um, And it's really all about how to become that credible leader of change and learn to influence and persuade others in your organization. Wow, that's fantastic. Very powerful. And I know that you um, have a free tool for my audience. So Anybody that really is relating to what Nancy's talking about today, you can grab this. Well, anybody can. Yes. It's called Strategy Quick Start 321 Workbook, COVID-19 Edition. So tell us a little bit about what that is all about. Yeah. So this was a tool that I created initially in February of 2017 when right after Trump was elected or inaugurated and some of the organizations I was working with 
were all of a sudden, you know, concerned they might not be able to meet their missions in the same way. What was the impact of the new administration going to be? Or they um, had raised a ton of money right in the wake of that and were wondering how to spend it in the most effective, impactful way. And so um, I created a tool for when you don't have the time, patience, or money to completely go through a you know long strategy development process to how do you, you know, in a kind of agile way, sort of quickly shift and find a path forward. And so I adapted that in the end of March for the pandemic moment um, to help organizations. And it was a process I used for my own business in that moment. And I've shared this with groups of entrepreneurs as well. So it's perfectly applicable in that situation. Um, But it helps you get out of that tornado spinny energy (laughs) and become the flywheel. So where um, it gives you three questions to ask yourself, two exercises, and then clarity around the one thing you must make time for every day or at least every week so that you can be the organization you want to be on the other side of this. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. I'll have to look at that myself. (laughs) So helpful. And this has been a great conversation. You've given us a whole lot of things to think about, a lot of nuggets to chew on. So thank you so much for coming and sharing your expertise and your knowledge. And uh, thank you for the work that you're doing in the world. Thanks for having me. This has been a great conversation. Yeah, it has been. And I'll put all the information in the show notes of how you all can get this tool from Nancy and her website and um, contact info. So thank you again. And ladies, just grab hold of this. This is good. Like she said, even for entrepreneurs or probably just anybody, if you're if you're dealing with the whirlwind that is COVID, yeah. <laughs> that I'm, I'm not sure it's going to go away anytime soon. And it it has been a whirlwind and overwhelm for many, many people. So it's nice to kind of have a tool to like ground yourself and get clear and, and keep yourself moving forward because that's key (laughs) to sanity and everything else. All right. Well, thanks again, Nancy and ladies, uh, as usual, just be confident, be real and be you. And thanks so much for listening today. I hope you enjoyed that episode and got a lot out of it that will help you on your journey to becoming fearlessly confident. If you would like to know how to work with me to help you to become fearlessly confident, just email me, Janelle at EmergingLifeCoaching.com. You can also go to my website. There's lots of great resources on there, including a free mini course called Be Confident, Be Real, Be You. It's a three video course with downloadable action guides that will definitely help you to get on this journey to becoming fearlessly confident. My website is EmergingLifeCoaching.com. Thanks for listening. And until next time, be fearless, be confident, and be you.